But there's also a one in two chance that the last words the guy said was, hey, y'all watch this. (laughs) Or, hold my beer. (laughs) (laughs) You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax. HIPAA help is on the way. This is Laurie with Gastro Associates in Gainesville, Georgia, and you're listening to Help Me With HIPAA podcast. Thank you for the intro. I am David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs and Security First IT. Joining me is Donna Grendel of Carden. Good morning, Donna. Good morning, David. (laughs) So for those of you who don't get to listen to us before the show starts, (laughs) you miss out on all the wondrous material that (laughs) will probably find its way back into the blooper reel at the end of the year. (laughs) That's all I'll say. (laughs) Uh, People don't realize it takes a while to get warmed up to, you know, ready to hit record. (laughs) Yeah, we 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 can't just you know sit down, hit record, and start you know being this uh, aware. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm just really tired today. That's all. That's all. Yeah. So there's no telling where this episode will go, but the topic is. Covering listener questions and input. Yes. So we've, we, we've yeah. gotten a, I mean, we've just got a, a flurry of stuff all of a sudden. So I said, we'll just throw them all together. Yep. So it's time now to cover your questions. The burning questions of the listeners. <laughs> or at least the ones, you know, <laughs> that our, our assistant or, or me kept up with. I think we yeah. found them all. If we find another one, don't worry. We'll throw it in the next episode. So. Yeah, and we have we do have a couple that came in that had to be translated, <laughs> <laughs> and then we learned it was, yeah, that yeah, was just they, fun they for didn't us. make the episode, but anyway, um, and we have a couple people who submitted their names with no question, and we don't really know what that means. I know, right? That one so, that one was weird. It's just name, email address, but yeah. if you did that and maybe you had problem typing in or whatever, come back. Mm-hmm. Come back and give us the uh, real question. We're eager yeah. to hear what it was. I know. So, anyway, before we dive into that, you have some things coming up. Where are you going to be? Where am I going to be? Well, let's see. This one comes out on August 2nd. Can you believe it's August? Mm, so, I know. Got a birthday coming up. Woo woo. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to be 102. Um, what am I going to be? Um, 48. I think that's right. Yeah. Man, I can't wait till you turn 50. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be, yeah. I'm going to make sure it's brutal. Parte. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I've said before, I turned my 50th birthday into six weeks of parties. <laughs> that doesn't shock me a bit <laughs> at all. <laughs> Look. I spent most of my twenties with people thinking I wasn't going to see the next day, and I, you know, <laughs> my well, mother even years. told me that a few times. <laughs> Keep it up; you're not going to see the next day. Uh, well, you and the wife have um, have two years to plan, so okay. um, you know maybe we can uh, put it together with a HIPAA boot camp, so we can just have a big party. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that'll be when we do the HIPAA boot camp cruise. There you go. There you go. Now we're talking. Yeah. There you go. All right. Yeah. So. On, get uh, George Fenton down and and uh, Ray Ribble and Chris Dix and whoever who's our other people that love to talk a lot <laughs> on, on the give us a bunch of feedback. There I can't you go. Remember. Yeah, we'll bring all of them in. There you go. <laughs> all right. So on August the eighth, which will be next week, oh, I better figure out what I'm talking about. I'll be at North Georgia MGMA in Dalton, Georgia, doing some other stuff up there, like spending a whole day running around, then driving back home. It's gonna be a long day. Uh, and then September the 26th, I'll be in Memphis for the Tennessee Ambulatory Surgical Center Association, or TASCA, TASCA, speaking there, that I believe that morning, keynote, and uh, cybersecurity and ransomware and all that good stuff. So I'm trying to work out dates with some other folks, but uh, I also booked another format approved uh, HIPAA course for the end of October. Just in the midst of that right now, that's going interestingly enough. Hmm. <laughs> lots of things happening. So lots going on, hard to figure out schedules. But hey, 
business is good. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to be, right? Well, that was the intent when I started the business. <laughs> to actually make a living at it, although some people seem to think that I don't really want to get paid. Yeah, I don't understand why people need to get paid. I know. <laughs> people ask, can, can you do this for free? And I was like, well, I'd love to, but uh, no, I, I yeah. like a house. I, I don't have a fancy house, you know, and I need a car to drive so that I can go do what you want me to do. Mm-hmm. Not a fancy car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll do anything for free as long as I'm paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's uh let's let's go before we go further off the rails and talk about you doing things for free, which is not gonna go well because anyway. All right, so let me first remind the listeners, head on over to iTunes, leave a review. Or Facebook we need them. or LinkedIn or yeah. where somewhere. Yeah. But we still get them in the inbox, the email inbox. Thanks for those. Appreciate it. Uh, but we do need something other people can see. And we <laughs> so love it when do you that. do. I mean, we say, hey, did you see that? It's awesome. I know. So uh, if you'll do that, we appreciate it. All right. So today's episode is coming up right after the break. Does your business work with medical practices? As a medical practice business associate, do you realize that if you have access to patient information, you have to follow the same HIPAA rules as your client? Call Cardin today at 678-292-5001 so they can assess your privacy and security practices to help ensure you are protected and prepared. Visit CardinHQ.com to learn more. Two-thirds of small businesses that experience a cybersecurity breach end up closing their doors within six months. Cyber criminals are targeting your practice and coming after your most sensitive data. Visit us online and schedule a time to talk about what you can do to protect yourself, your patients, and your practice. Our website is securityfirstit.com. That's securityfirstit.com. All right, so the first question comes in uh, from a listener talking about the chances of being hit by cyber (laughs) versus a bear attack. Well, yeah, it it wasn't a... Somebody sent it to me and said, have you seen this? Because, well, you know, once we talk about it, it's clear it's something we would find interesting. But it's uh, <laughs> it's published by uh, Veronis, which is a company that makes uh, security platform tools for risk management and all those kind of things. So, you know, they're always going to take stuff and do what any of us would do. It's, uh, you know, here's some information that makes us that's relevant to our industry. Let's throw it out there. And they had gotten information from the World Economic Forum's 2018 Global Risk Report that said the top three risks to global stability over the next five years are natural disasters, extreme weather, and cyber attacks. Yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah. Look at the sky, look at the ground. (laughs) They look all around. your computer. (laughs) (laughs) So... Then the question, you know, they really went through is, okay, well, let's look at stats for other things of the, you know, what are the likelihood of some of these things happening? And so (laughs) one in four chance of being hit by a cyber attack. And that that came from a Poneman estimate. I would say that to clarify that, it would be a one in four chance of a successful cyber attack because I I say that we're attacked all the time. Yeah, because, they're, they're trying to get in all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can look at my firewall logs at home and I'm, you know, I've got a thousand hits, you know, a month, if not more people trying to get in. So, yeah, I think the, you know, the chances of you having a cyber attack is one in one. <laughs> <laughs> the chances of somebody getting in maybe is one in four. But anyway, proceed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, home burglary, burglaries or invasion, home invasions. You know, we got uh, I got security systems at home, but well, we don't have to talk about my paranoia. It's my job. But they had a one in fifty chance. So the an average of two million households uh, in the U.S. get uh, broken into each year, and they say there's over 126 million homes in the United States. So there you go. A 1.7% chance, which is 1 in 50. Having your tax return audited, 1 in 100. 
That's more scary than a cyber attack. <laughs> <laughs> but less likely. Yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> and what's interesting is what, it, you know, because, again, it, we're we're working our way up, you know, like bear attack and all of this. So still at one in four for a cyber attack. One in 3,000 for getting a hole in one. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I just did that like last week playing putt-putt. <laughs> <laughs> so, I got dang. it through the castle and everything. <laughs> well, I will have to say, I'm also the guy that had triplets, and there's like a one in 8,000 chance of that happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true that. <laughs> so, you know, I can't win the lottery, but I can win the other things. <laughs> uh, so speaking of that, one in 14,600 of being struck by lightning if you live to be 80 years old. You know, that happened while I was in Clearwater, Florida last week. Like somebody got hit by lightning on the beach. No way. Yes. And people said that, like, the guy that got hit, I, I guess that, like, the people that were around him, because, you know, the beach is crowded, but it, like, threw people away from the area, like, like a big thing blew up or something. It was crazy. But the guy was in critical condition, but last I heard, I think he didn't didn't fare well. Ooh. But, yeah, last week, crazy. Yeah, and you're in a group of people, and it picks you out. Mm-hmm. Now, what did he just say? Yeah. <laughs> It's probably like, man, it's hot out here. Jeez, oh, it's. I mean, that, that's that's how random things are. So he was one in fourteen thousand six hundred getting mm-hmm. attacked by a bear. You know, and we always use the uh, the analogy that you don't have to be faster than the bear; you just have mm-hmm. to be faster than the other guy running from the bear. Mm-hmm. One in two point seven million, your chance, and and that's based on. Yellowstone uh, National Park, there's one in 2.7 million chance that a park visitor is attacked by a grizzly bear. But there's also a one in two chance that the last words the guy said was, hey, y'all watch this. (laughs) Or, hold my beer. (laughs) 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 Or both in some sequence. (laughs) Uh, And then the likelihood of getting attacked by a shark. Is one in three point seven five million. Yeah, I still ain't going in the water. I'm not scared of the sharks anymore. I'm scared all right. of all the flesh eating bacteria and brain eating amoebas. Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> I'm like, I have never seen stuff like this in my life. Yeah, I mean, people are having like bugs pulled out of their eyeball, <laughs> and I mean, it's just crazy. You I see know. that a, the guy had a tick on his eyeball. Uh-uh. Oh, no, oh, I hadn't seen that one. That's crazy. I choose not to participate. But anyway, you know, uh, everybody worries about shark-infested waters, and you see all of the pictures they're showing you all the time, you know, the in the kayak and the uh, sharks all around, and yes, it's terrifying. Dying in a commercial plane crash. <laughs> One in 16 million. So mm-hmm. All of you that are afraid of flying and never fly, you drive everywhere, but... You use password one, two, three, and you sit on your computer all day. Just saying. You might want to <laughs> rethink your plans. Well, they know they're probably not going to die from a cyber attack, so it's not doesn't hold that much value. Mm. <laughs> well, one in 16 million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> probably not going to die from a commercial flight either. All right. Winning the lottery. Here's David's. <laughs> yeah, I can't do this. <laughs> one in 175 million. For a Powerball or Mega Million jackpot, one of the big ones, you know. Mm-hmm. So does is, that mean if the if the jackpot is over one hundred seventy five million, and I buy it one hundred seventy five million tickets, I will come out ahead? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I still wouldn't win. You still wouldn't win. <laughs> uh, but you know, and to me, I, what's fascinating to me for the people that play the lottery and occasionally, you know. I'm going to grab a few things because I'm standing there at the store and bored and there's the machine or something. And uh, uh, But I'm not really focused on it like a lot of people are. But what's fascinating to me is when the numbers get big, that's when everybody buys a ticket. Yeah, which is the worst time to buy. Because that drives up, you know, drives up the number of players and drives down the statistical uh, advantage you may have. But, you know, it starts at like $2 million. And even if you ended up with a million, what would be wrong with that? You just can't do anything with a million dollars these days. (laughs) (laughs) 
Okay, so back to, <laughs> again, one in four chance of a cyber attack, yet buying lottery tickets. So mm -hmm. you statistically need to uh, remember that when you're buying a lottery ticket, I want you to think about, uh, man, I need to secure the network. And then, of course, picking a perfect March Madness bracket. <laughs> and it was calculated because, you know, you got 63 games throughout the tournament. You got a 50-50 chance of each one of them. Mm -hmm. It's 9.2 quintillion. Wow. One in 9.2 quintillion. Of getting a perfect March Madness bracket. Wow. And so every March, you still have everybody just... Sweating it out. I've made it two rounds. <laughs> That's what you should do when you start leaving work. Like, I didn't get cyber attacked today. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we should do. <laughs> yeah. Number of days, you know, without an accident. Number of days without a successful cyber attack. So, you know what? If you're playing Russian roulette with a six shooter, you have a one in six chance of getting hit. Just yeah. saying. There you go. But don't ever play with an automatic. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Never mind. You'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. So moving right along, because I thought I was the one that was going to have trouble today, but we see who it is. Let's move on to a uh, listener question. So thanks for sending that in. Uh, and our, our listener question comes in and it's, uh, oh, where is it, David? Oh, the physicians would like to use electronic signatures for one of our locations, specifically they want to sign at a POC using electronic keypads. Please advise of HIPAA, computer, or compliance issues in POC. I'm assuming they mean point of care. So, uh, you want to take that one, David? Hmm. <laughs> so this be on, this would be off the cuff here, but uh, let's see. Well, I mean, we, we haven't really reviewed any of these. We're just answering. <laughs> yeah, they're off the cuff for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, so as far as any computer issues, um, I, mean, I don't see any computer issues coming up for that. I mean, certainly well, it's, from a, it, nothing different than what you you know you got to worry about firmware and how it connects and all, but all the things that a risk analysis mm -hmm. would give you. Right, but from, from a technology standpoint, can it happen? Yes. <laughs> can you do it? Yes. Is yeah, there? Should you do it? <laughs> Is is there potential security issues with it? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is with the computer that you connect those things to as well. So the question is, if you have a plan to properly secure the device, then you don't really have computer issues of any sort. And you document that plan, so that takes care of a lot of your HIPAA concerns. And then the other compliance concerns, electronic signatures are now legally tending signatures, and uh, we use them everywhere. So I really don't see a problem with it as long as you've done a risk analysis and you know how you're going to secure the device. Do you, David? Mm -hmm. No, not that I can think of. And make sure that the signatures are not being saved to the device, and if they are, then it needs to be protected as PHI. Yeah, you, you, I mean, you, that would be part of going through the risk analysis. How does the device work? What goes on it? How do I secure it? And any other kinds of things that, the, you know, let's say we're, we're going to do the signature thing, but it also has like a, uh, a card scanner. Okay, well, if we're not going to use that card scanner, let's turn it off. Mm -hmm. You know, let's don't let that be reading things and dumping things somewhere that someone could use. So those kind of things, document your risk analysis and uh, make sure you have a plan to monitor and maintain the security on it. Yep. I think now, that's our that, answer. Yeah. The other thing is, where is the signature going? You know, are you going to need a BA, BAA rather, with somebody? Mm -hmm. So, but I, it all falls back to doing your assessment. Yep. And, and answering all those questions <laughs> and, and any more that can come up. <laughs> yeah. You think about everything that could go wrong and see if it's something that you need to worry about. There you go. Yep. Do a risk analysis is the answer. Yep. Mini SRA. <laughs> yeah. Mini SRA. Trying to give things appropriate names. Then we did, uh, I don't know if you guys uh, had all, we don't talk about it that much anymore, but we still have a listener survey out there. And uh, on the on every um, webpage uh, for every episode, you can click it and just go answer a survey. And we 
get a few, and we we have implemented some of the things that people put on the survey, so we do appreciate it. And um, there was one that came in just like yesterday or, you know, the last couple of days, and it had a lot of interesting stuff in it. So I wanted to cover more than just the question section on it. The, we always ask, you know, what would make our website more helpful? Mm-hmm. And uh, this response was a printable, downloadable list of episodes and a one or two sentence description of the episode like liner notes in Spotify to help log training time and topics. Hmm. So we have two responses to that. First, there's the app, right, David? Yeah. Yeah. You can download the help me with HIPAA podcast app and there are show notes in PDF format for every episode. And you just tap the little present because we're giving you a present. (laughs) You tap it, it'll open up the PDF. You email it. You, know, you can write notes or however you choose to document to prove that you actually showed up and listen to that, what your thoughts are. Generally, we tell everybody to you know put uh, a few notes about what you got out of the episode and put that with it, and there's your training. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's built in. It's already there. The list thing, we're happy to take volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, it's something I, I mean, I've been trying to figure out how to get it done and we just don't have the resources with our vast investments. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should go up on the cost of the podcast. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we will double it. <laughs> <laughs> Two times. Yeah, uh, It's going to start costing you twice as much to listen. <laughs> but, but if anybody's willing to volunteer, to help out and and make stuff like that for us, let us know, and uh, you know we'll be happy to take help with that. And I think it's a great idea. Just don't have the the resources to invest in it, and uh, you know we're churning these things out and have a system to get them out, and it it takes a substantial amount of time already. I just don't have any more time to devote to it, but. Hey, community volunteers, we're o- we're open to open source lists. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to help out, help me with HIPAA. <laughs> if you want to help, help me. <laughs> help, help, help me. Okay, so <laughs> we just went through that. Help me, Ron. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> All right. So then there was uh, any other feedback for us, and uh, it was an excellent suggestion that we had not thought of. Mm-hmm. Do a giveaway or contest for admission to your next HIPAA boot camp. We mm-hmm. thought it was a fantastic idea. All right. I wonder if we can give Donna away. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> My mom said, you know, they'd always, she'd always be sent back if, if anybody took me. She never worried. <laughs> they'd just, I'd bounce back pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> but. I think it's a great idea, and David and I already started to try to figure out what we could do and how we could structure it, because we are talking about uh, the next boot camp. Um, The idea of doing it on the West Coast has proven, at least right now, to be cost prohibitive and logistically prohibitive, at least right now. We haven't given up on it, but we have decided we're probably only going to do two next year. We're going to do one more this year because we did promise. And we'll do one in the spring and one in the fall next year. And uh, probably going to be like the beginning of November. So we, by the next podcast, we ought to be able to give you a, a date for uh, the last 2019 boot camp. And it will be here in uh, Tucker, Georgia again. Mm-hmm. But uh, know that for that boot camp, we will probably run something uh, that uh, gives you a special deal that you have a chance to get a special deal on. But I don't know what that'll be. Either way, good idea. We'll implement it in some form or fashion. Yeah, so see, we do listen and read. All right. But then the same folks that dropped off the, and these are <laughs> anonymous, anonymous, so. A lot of times, uh, unless you put your name in there, we don't know who you are. So, But that's fine because that's what everybody likes to do on the interwebs. So here are the questions. And mm-hmm. there were three, four questions in there. They were all very good. 
how do we handle disclosures of PHI for a patient who is in a nursing home, is brought in by a nurse aide or transportation for care, doesn't have a power of attorney or other caregiver present to sign intake forms and help coordinate care? Probably happens often. Mm -hmm. The first thing you remember here is patient care comes first. So you've got to figure out what's the best solution for the patient, not the paperwork. And often, you know, HIPAA does allow for uh, if someone is responsible for the care at that moment, then they can um, admit. Now, sometimes the individual that's brought in has the ability to do that for themselves. If they are, then you just let the patient do it for themselves. But if they do not have that capacity, which we know does happen in those scenarios, then um, you've got to look at what does the patient need and contact the facility. You know, go again, go ahead and figure out what's best for the patient, but contact the facility to get details on any consents or authorizations that they may have. Because obviously they have provided some and sometimes it involves the state or some of these other things, but you can do that behind the scenes, so to speak, because you don't want to create any kind of agitation for a patient coming from a nursing home that can't respond and and do this on their own. So I would suggest contacting the facility and even working with the local facilities to say, look, when you're going to send your people over, this is what we would like to see, or even better, what can we do to work together to take care of the back end and make sure we're doing the right thing for the patient so that they don't suffer in any way? That is the best solution is, you know, because there's only so many in the area. And if you work with them and have them do certain policies and procedures and you do them and you all agree to them, then it is helpful. And I know like hospitals work with law enforcement on those kind of things and agree to the policies and procedures. It's it's not unheard of. So highly recommend. Number one, always worry about the patient first. Do what's right for the patient. Number two, contact the facility if nothing else. And uh, uh, number three, get the uh, a plan worked out with the local facilities And number four, if you have to count on consent of who brought them in, then that's all you've got to work with. Work with that. But again, patient care comes first. Which is also the answer to number two. (laughs) 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 Yeah. So this question is, uh, how do I get staff to care about protecting information? And likewise, how do I convince upper management to be inconvenienced by security? Well, it's about patient care. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and, you know, that's what we've done a lot uh, and had a lot of success in our HIPAA training doesn't talk about necessarily this is what the law says, this is what you're supposed to do, that over and over with a video of, you know, this is how you do this, and it's just little stuff. We talk about this is about caring for the patient because most people – in healthcare really do want to care for the patient. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, there's not a lot you can do. They're not going to care about anything else either. That's how you get staff to care. When you're talking with clinicians, you talk about what can happen to your patient if we fail them. And there are a litany of stories of examples of the stress it puts them under, the financial destruction that can happen, their inability to trust healthcare, that that they uh, don't believe they can tell you anything, and now you're hampering their ability to get care. Uh, the importance of their participation in care. So I mean, you talk about that, and then that is why you want to do privacy and security. Yeah. So, and I and I think from the patient standpoint, they have an expectation of privacy and security that is already happening. And yeah, they can't believe it's not right. And, you know, we've talked before about, is there, um, is there a disconnect between what the patients, uh, are, should be getting and what, and what's getting delivered. And so there's a crisis of trust within healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing that 
kind of being played out more and more because people are seeing more and more breaches happening and things like that. And they're going, wait a minute. I thought, I thought HIPAA was doing this thing, which causes these people to, to protect my data. And why, mm -hmm. why is this not happening? Yeah. I think I first started talking about my concern that we were going to build a crisis of, t of trust in healthcare way back in like 2013 because I was, you know, reading where a patient said, now I'm afraid to tell my doctor anything. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know that as everything gets on the news more and more that, you know, that that was going to start happening. And once it does happen to a patient, they are never the same when dealing with healthcare. Right. They are never the same. They do not feel they can trust. They do not feel that you honestly do care about them. Because if you didn't care about protecting their privacy and the security of their information, you probably don't care about me. So yeah. that's the way you teach the staff. And yeah. it's also your upper management generally the same thing, except you take it another level and you point out that this is a business decision. And when you make this business decision, you are either deciding to secure the company or not. And you need to write that down and say, this is my decision and this is how I want to run the business. Mm -hmm. and, and think about how that decision is going to be taken when you have to publicly state that was your decision. Yeah. Because, because if, so, if something yeah. goes wrong, I mean, we, we see it all the time, not just in healthcare, but other industries where the people that are, that are victims of breaches are now coming back and suing organizations. Mm -hmm. And so can you stand up in a court of law and say, I have taken reasonable and appropriate actions to secure the privacy and security uh, and CIA mm -hmm. <laughs> confidentiality, integrity and availability of this data. Have you done enough? You know, and, and I think most people are going to say, no, I really haven't. And, and is that what you want to say? Yeah. I mean, that's, you just get to the bottom line. Look, this is a business decision, and that's how we talk to uh, business owners. It's a business decision. I respect you get to decide how to run your business. Mm -hmm. So then we take away all of the nobody gets to tell me what to do response. It, you're making a decision. I'm going to give you the facts that I think are important. You can ask me any question you want. I will provide the answers the best I know how to help give you what I believe is important for you to consider when you're making that decision. But once you make that decision, you've made it because you can't waffle on it because your company's either going to run one way or the other when it comes to security. You decide mm -hmm. there's no middle with security. You can't right. do part security. You're either doing it or you're not. It's kind of like saying, oh, well, I'm going to lock only the back door. The front door, it has lights on it. We don't have to worry about it. You can't do that. You either mm -hmm. lock all the doors and the windows or you don't lock any. So that's, uh, that's uh, how we at least try to yeah. get all of them involved because it is, A, about protecting your patients, and that is why you're in business. And if you're not a covered entity, then – we're gonna have we're gonna have an episode to talk about the AMCA breach. It's one data breach can not only put you out of business, but it could impact all your clients as well. Mm -hmm. So, but that's a whole nother story. And with a business associate, you're digging a deeper hole there, and and you're really doubling down on the business decision and what you're representing that you're doing with your clients. So yeah. there you go. Well, it makes me wonder about their actual patient care. If I know they're not doing security, mm -hmm. then I really question how good the rest of their patient care is. You know, that's like if I walk into a medical facility and it's obvious their technology is 20 years old, I probably am not going to let them do surgery on me, right? <laughs> yeah, you're going to you're gonna feel uncomfortable with them staying up with the times and and knowing that technology is offering all of these new ways to... Uh, do surgery and right. to treat conditions. Yeah. So if you're not in, you know, in my opinion, and of course I'm coming from an IT view, but if I walk in and I see your systems are that bad, then I'm probably, I have no faith that you have also kept up with the technology 
of your business outside of just the computers and things. Mm -hmm. But and, we're and, able to we're able to make that call. But I did have a doctor once ask me, "What if we just go back to paper?" <laughs> Just, I just mm -hmm. want to go back to paper. They made me do this EMR. I don't want to do it. I want to go back to paper. Will that change anything? It'll change two things. One is your patients come in and say, wow, <laughs> all you do is paper. That will <laughs> impact. Some patients won't care. But if you want to keep having patients, the new patients and the ones that are the millennials and the ones that are coming along – they will care. I would care. You know? oh, yeah. I would want to know, why are you just doing paper? Oh, mm -hmm. well, I'm doing paper because I don't want to deal with all that security stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm going to cut you open with a butter knife. Yeah. And, but, <laughs> <no> <laughs> but number two is that the you're not following the technology, but it also doesn't make HIPAA go away. Because HIPAA applied before the EMRs existed. It's just most people ignored it. Mm -hmm. You're still responsible for the privacy and security involved with that paper. You still have to have proper disposal. You still have to have proper access controls. You still have to have proper ability to uh, destroy it and those kind of things. And how you share it. All of that still applies unless you're not going to file any insurance. Because most of the insurance companies require you to do that electronically. They don't take paper claims. So now you're going to have to remember that you still do practice management. And just getting off the EMR doesn't take data off the computers. Mm -hmm. So if I'm just going to go back to paper, I'm probably going to have to quit taking insurance, take patient payments only, handle those payments with, with a knuckle buster. Uh <laughs> <laughs> And if you don't know what one is, go look it up and get a picture of it. But you you can't go back to paper in, in when it comes to running your business and taking payments and insurance and all of that. So it still applies. It's just you never paid attention before the EMR existed for you in your day-to-day -day work. True. So there you go. All right. On to the next question. Yeah, boy. All right, ready. Donna, here you go. Is it a breach if the office sends PHI to another coding entity not involved in the patient's care. For example, a follow-up letter is sent to a primary care physician, let's say Dr. Smith. However, the office sent it to the wrong Dr. Smith, <laughs> who has never seen the patient. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so this happens all the time uh, in healthcare. It's, it's unfortunate, but there are there are, you know, there's so much information flying around and there are doctors with the same name. And, you know, I, I, it's happened ironically to me uh, when they got my uh, primary care doctor uh, selected wrong in the EMR, but nobody told me that I probably had this occur, which, well, you know. Anyhow, yeah, they, knew, they knew not to tell you. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I get, I, it was on my list of things to review the administrator. <laughs> so, you know, she hung her head. What did we do wrong? Well, let me review. <laughs> this happened here. This happened here. You know, and it was nothing horrid, but if it's happening to me, it's happening to everybody, and it could be horrid. So, that, and I'm not giving you free consulting. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> So, first of all, the first part of it is, yes, it's a breach. Mm -hmm. The question, what you're really asking is, is it a reportable breach? Do I have to notify the patient? Do I have to notify HHS? That's really what you're looking for. Because if the data is sent to someone that has no reason of, uh, to have it, it's a breach. Period. Mm -hmm. Right. The next question is, what kind of breach is it? Yeah. What happened and, next? <laughs> yeah. So that's the real question. And um and and that's what I say maybe to because yes, it is a breach. The first step you do is you go through the three exclusions. And in most cases, in this scenario, you could use one of the three exclusions that says that looks at the individual the information was sent to. And another covered entity is responsible for protecting it. You call them up. They say they shredded it. They got rid of it. You're good to go. And you can document that. And I reiterate, document that 
as an incidental thing that occurred, it would go into your accounting of disclosures, but you wouldn't necessarily have to notify the uh, patient in HHS if you evaluated it fully and you felt like you could count on this other entity to do the right thing. If you're not sure that that would work, though, then you go into the four-factor assessment to determine low probability of compromise. And you document all of those things and evaluate whether or not you think you have enough evidence that there was a low probability of compromise, even though you couldn't use an exclusion, low probability compromise, and I don't need to notify. Otherwise, you notify the patient and you notify HHS uh, within 60 days of the end of the year. So there you go. All right. Easy peasy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you have a breach. Moving right along. <laughs> All right. Next one. All right. If upper management won't approve compliance software in the budget, what's the best way to organize compliance activities using the good old fashioned three ring binder method? <laughs> First of all, don't use the three ring binder method, even if that's all you have. <laughs> <laughs> We just talked about you don't want to have everything on paper. No. So you definitely, you know, you can print it out and have it on paper. You know, a lot of people feel people are tactile. They have to touch it to know that they have it. But then you have to have a policy and procedure on how you're going to make sure that stays up to date with any changes that you make. But the only thing that I know of that other people use, and we've talked about this before, about how you could do it on the cheap. Mm -hmm. But again, this involves writing very specific policies and procedures. We both use project management software like Trello. That's what we've used from the beginning to run the podcast now for five years. We have a Trello board. It's full of crap at this point, but I've been trying to clean it up. But still, it's where we can go find all of our documentation. And as I'm reading, I just post things out on the list there, and I can pull from that list. And you, they have a free version, and you can use that for your project management tool that the software gives you. You could also use that for your incident and event documentation. What other things, you know, you're mostly going to end up with spreadsheets and documents and folders. But you've got to make sure you control the access to the folder structure so that everybody has access to this information, but they can't edit it. They can read mm -hmm. it, and only the certain people can edit it. And then there's other information that everybody doesn't have access. It's on a need-to-know basis, and you have all of those. And then uh, it's how you do document sharing, whether you use a tool like Dropbox for Business with a BAA or Microsoft Office 365 with a BAA or a server, file G server, Suite. or G Suite with a BAA, mm -hmm. any of those. So then you can create storage and you know where things are and you're going to have to create your own indices. But... That's where you can keep your documentation. And then the big tricky thing is contract management because you're going to need, and you can use a Trello board to manage your contracts and connect it to the documents, but you'll have to build your own reminder systems in there manually. You could do some things if you get Trello for Teams with Butler and automate some stuff on Trello. I'm a big fan of using it. We've been able to use it for anything that we want. Mm -hmm. You know, if you sit down and think about it, it's pretty easy to use. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a, there's lots of ways to do this and, you know, cheap or free. Mm -hmm. It just, the thing about free is it typically does cost you. Somewhere. It, it, may, it may not cost you your money, but it's going to cost you in time or effort or something. There's always mm -hmm. a, uh, there's always a price to pay for free. Capability <laughs> is going to be impacted somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So even if you do the three ring binder, you're still paying for that somewhere in inefficiencies. Well, well, and if, if you were going to do the three-ring binder, even then, you you have to break it down, mm -hmm. just like you would the folders. You know, everybody has access to this. This is where I keep my documentation. This is where I keep my contracts. This is where I keep our, our regular reports, our operational compliance reports, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there you go. There we go. All, All right. right, so we got two quickies that we need to get in real quick. Quickies. Yeah, actually three. I added one while you were talking. Oh, man. <laughs> That's what happened. Okay. All right. So uh, you, you can hit the next one then. 
Go All right. ahead. Uh, so, hi, David and Donna. Uh, thanks for putting me first. <laughs> I provide IT services for medical practices and have been listening to your podcast from the start and love it. Of course you do. Thank you. One issue, though. I appreciate your concern about how folks misspell HIPAA, H-I-P-A-A. One of my clients provided documents to patients that read H-I-P-P-A throughout the entire document. I only noticed this when they offered me a free eye exam and had me review slash sign their notice of privacy. While you criticize those who misspell HIPAA, you at times refer to Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. Your guests have done this as well in episode 197 with Jack. Don't you mean insurance rather than information? Sorry to be a nitpick, Larry. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, good, good catch, Larry. Good catch. Uh, the other thing I would <laughs> have to say, though, is... I don't know if you did this on purpose or not. But it's I have funny to say, if you did. But I, yeah, because I laughed hysterically that in your criticism of our criticism, you misspelled the word misspell. <laughs> <laughs> yes. While you criticize those who misspell is misspelled. So that was funny. And if you did it yep. on purpose, even brilliant. funnier. Yeah, yeah. You're awesome if you did it on purpose. That's great. <laughs> But yeah, we we do not pay close enough attention to that, and uh, we do not uh, do it. Uh, we we now will pay closer attention because, uh, and we try not to correct our guest. Uh, I I recall when that happened, but it's really hard if you have to correct the guest. Yeah, I mean, and and editing is kind of hard whenever it would be their voice cut out and my voice put in real quick. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, yes. So but no, but, the, we, but when but we the, do it, it's it's absolutely we would smack ourselves in the head if we notice it. Clearly, we yeah. don't notice it. But the fact, Larry, that you listen that intently is is pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> freaking awesome, dude. <laughs> I know. That's pretty impressive, honestly, Larry. So, uh, Miss, and we're fine if you're a nitpick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all well, right. I'm really fine if you're a nitpicking of David, so go ahead and do that all you want. <laughs> all right. So next. Next, uh, talk about office space. Hello, Donna and David. Question for you uh, or for the podcast. If we lease office space in a building we do not own and store PHI, such as paper charts, within that space, is the owner of the building a business associate? Our administrators say no, because... It'd be like if we were running a clinic and leased space, but I'm not so confident, especially after listening to episode 119 about leasing data center space. Simi. All right. So good question. Yep. And and I, I happen to know that uh, Simi's early learner and, and really, you know, learning a lot from the podcast hasn't been in the HIPAA world very long. And so there is a distinct difference between leasing the data center space and the running an office and storing paper charts in it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, with the data center space, they have access to the data on their network. Technically, in the office space where you store things, you're supposed to be the one with the key. And it's understood that the landlord would not access that space. They can't see it. They're not supposed to get to it. So it's not a requirement for them to be your landlord to be able to get into there uh, and and monitor the traffic uh, that would include the PHI. So it's not like somebody walks in, holds up the record to the security camera <laughs> of the paper, and then walks in and puts it in, which is essentially what's happening in, on a network where all the traffic uh, of the PHI, they could technically watch all the PHI moving around their network. So that's why it's different. Is that good enough, David? Yeah, good enough for me. <laughs> well, Simi, you <laughs> let me know. You know how to reach me, so let me know if that doesn't work for you. All right. All right. Last but not least, drum roll. All right. Donna and David, just catching up on a few episodes of the podcast. In episode 207, David talks about a scenario where his employees are required to bring in another employee if they need to make a stop while transporting PHI. David suggests that his employees think that this procedure may be overkill, but here's what I think. Never underestimate the value of overkill. Even if David's employees think the procedure <laughs> is overkill, that's a good thing because they realize how important it is today with the PHI be protected at all times, even when doing so is not convenient. 
As always, thank you both for all the time and effort you put into making such a great podcast. Chris Dix. Hey, Chris. How you doing? What up, Chris? <laughs> so David got so excited because you agreed with him. And yep. Yep. and so I agree with Chris, not with David. <laughs> uh, <laughs> by default, by proxy, you agree with me. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, yes, yes, it could be overkill. And sometimes overkill, it, it becomes a, a problem. But in this scenario, because it is so easy for these tech people to mess that up, that's one of those areas where overkill is done on purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, there's overkill because of paranoia that then makes it hard to do your job. It does not make it hard to do your job to do this version of overkill. No, because they have an option, right? Yeah. Yeah, just don't stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Come straight to the office, then go do what you got to do. Yeah, there's your option. So, yeah, it, 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 absolutely spot on there, Chris, as usual. <laughs> All right. That is our show for today, folks. Remember to share us out. Follow us on your favorite social media site. Rate our podcast. We need the ratings. We need your help. Spread the word. So remember for Donna and myself, the HIPAA. It's not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.